नानम परमम धेयम नॉलेज इज सुप्रीम In the last lecture, we defined what a catalyst is and what are the implications or utility of catalysts in various systems and how it may affect the yield and selectivity. In this lecture, we will start by looking at some properties of the catalyst. So, catalytic reaction typically occurs at the fluid solid interface So, therefore, clearly the reaction would be a function of the surface area which is available for the reaction. surface area available for the reaction or the interfacial area which is available for the reaction to occur. So, the large interface, so catalyst, property, catalyst particles actually facilitate availability of large area for the reaction to happen and this actually is possible because of the various pores that are present in the catalyst. And these pores, there are several pores that may be present in the catalyst and these pores together actually offer availability of large area at which the in which the reaction can actually hap happen. So, such kind of catalysts are typically called as porous catalysts. Suppose we sketch a catalyst, let us assume that the catalyst is spherical in nature. and there may be many pores which are actually present inside. And each of these pores will have surface which is present along the walls of the pores which can actually facilitate or make available fluid solid interface at which the chemical reaction can happen. So, these porous catalysts actually offer this unique advantage of providing large surface area for the reaction to happen. So, let us take a specific example and look at what is the kind of or what is the ballpark surface area which may be available for the reaction to happen. So, let us take the example of silica alumina catalyst. silica alumina catalyst. So, the typical volume of the catalyst, the typical volume of the catalyst is about 0.6 centimeter cube per gram of the catalyst and the average pore radius is approximately 4 nanometers and the surface area which is available for the reaction is about 300 meter square per gram of the catalyst. So, the kind of surface area which is available is actually phenomenal as one can see from this example and these are typical numbers which is applicable for most of the catalytic systems. So, the pore radius is very very small it is in the nanometer scale and so in a catalyst whose typical diameter could be about 3 millimeters or so the pores are actually very very small it is about 4 nanometer pore uh, through which the fluid can actually go through 
and when the fluid goes through the surface area which is available for the reaction is approximately in the order of 300 meter square per gram of the catalyst. So, this is a phenomenal amount of surface area which is available for the reaction or the phenomenal amount of fluid solid uh, contact area which is available for the reaction to happen. So, such catalysts having very high surface area we because of these pores are typically referred to as what is called as the porous catalyst. There are several examples of these for example, Rane nickel is one type which is actually used in hydrogenation. Hydrogenation reaction, hydrogenation of vegetable and animal oils. It is you and another example is platinum on alumina. So, platinum is actually coated on a support called alumina and we will discuss in a while what the supported uh, catalysts are and this is typically used in reforming of petroleum naphtha. And then another example is promoted iron which is used in ammonia synthesis. So, these are some of the typical examples of catalyst which is used in different processes. So, sometimes pores are very small, sometimes some catalysts have very very small pores and such catalysts actually have unique advantage because they allow only small molecules to enter these pores. This has a unique advantage because only small molecules are allowed and therefore, only certain molecules which may be participating or available in the reacting mixture would be allowed to enter the catalyst pores. So, as a result this can actually facilitate good selectivity for a desired product. And such kind of catalysts are called as molecular sieves. These molecular sieves are becoming very popular these days. It is used in many, many different systems because it has this ability to facilitate high selectivity because it only permits a certain small molecules to enter the catalyst pores and by and thereby it prevents the other species from participating in the reaction. Remember that the reaction is actually happening at the fluid solid interface in the walls of the pores inside the catalyst particle. Moreover, it actually allows one to actually control the residence time of the species inside the catalyst. So, one of the important factor that actually controls the reaction is basically the total time for which the species which is participating in the reaction is actually staying inside the pores and is in contact with the fluid solid interface. So, the fact that these molecular sieves have very tiny pores, it has very selective uh, abil ability to selectively allow only certain species to go inside the pores, it can one can actually have an ability to control the residence time of these species uh, in, in the catalyst particle and thereby actually provides an ability to control the reaction better. A good example of this is the use of zeolites catalyst. Zeolites catalyst for selective which is selective to xylene formation from 
toluene and methane. It's a very good example of such molecular sleeves which is actually very selective to a particular speed product formation. So, it is not that all catalysts are actually having such kind of uh, extended surface and it is not necessarily required. So, there are typically two classes of catalysts one can think of. So, one is called the supported catalyst. Another one is called the unsupported catalyst. So, supported catalysts are those where the catalytic material which can typically be oxides of noble metal so on and so forth. These will be impregnated in, in the particle form on the surface of a supporting material. For instance, the supporting material could be silicon or it could be alumina and maybe the catalyst particles such as platinum are actually impregnated on the surface or the sites which are actually available in this support material. Good example is platinum on alumina and these are basically minute particle which are actually impregnated on the uh, local surface of the uh, catalyst particles or uh, local surface of the supported support system. Okay. So, unsupported catalyst is where such a support is not required and directly the catalyst particles are actually used as a catalyst material is used as a reacting fluid solid interface. For example, platinum wire gas platinum wire gas which is used for ammonia oxidation. Normally, a supported catalyst would actually require you know higher pressure drop because the pores in the catalyst are very tiny and the fluid particle actually has to go inside the pores. So, in case there are situations where we require low pressure drops and heat removal is an issue, then one would actually want to consider unsupported catalyst for such type of reactions. So, unsupported catalyst is typically favored when low pressure drop is desired and heat removal is an issue. In both these cases unsupported catalyst is actually preferred over supported catalyst. So, let us look at some examples. So, for supported catalyst platinum on alumina which is used for petro petroleum reforming and vanadium pentoxide on silica which is used for oxidizing SO2 in H2SO4 production process and for unsupported catalyst. platinum gauss which is typically used for ammonia oxidation. And then promoted iron which is used for ammonia synthesis, silica alumina which is used for dehydrogenation and typically used in butadiene manufacturing. So, these are the typical examples of supported versus the unsupported catalyst and remember that supported catalyst will require a substrate on which the active catalyst material is actually impregnated in this substrate material. So, let us ask this question as to how does a catalyst work.
how does it facilitate acceleration or deceleration depending upon the situation, how does it facilitate affecting the rate of the reaction. So, what happens is that the, the species which needs to react actually goes into these pores or into gets access to the surface of the catalyst and this catalyst somehow interacts with the species which is present, the species which is participating in the reaction somehow interacts with the catalyst material. And this interaction can be of typically of two types. So, the interaction can be a chemical adsorption or a physical adsorption. So, typically the adherence or the species which adheres to the material that process is what is called as adsorption process. And this is a very typical process which actually is involved in the gas phase reactions which is catalyzed by solid surface. Now, usually one or all the molecules which is participating in the reaction have to adsorb onto the surface or they have to interact with the surface in order for the reaction to happen at the solid surface. So, the physical adsorption essentially involves, involves physically the species come and bind on to the surface of the catalyst and this of course is a function of temperature, it is an exothermic reaction and it, it turns out that the typical delta H which is, which is actually corresponding to the physical adsorption is of the order of 4 to 62 kilo joules per mole and in a similar fashion the chemical adsorption the delta H adsorption which is once again an exothermic reaction. So, one needs to supply heat for the uh, species to actually adsorb onto the surface and so the delta H adsorption is typically of the order of 40 to 400 kilo joules per mole. And you may recall from your first course on reaction engineering that the delta H reaction for many reactions is also typically in the same order as that of this. The delta H reaction is in the same order of magnitude as that of the delta H of the adsorption. In fact, most of the cases, most of the reactions the adsorption typically is actually a, a chemical adsorption and therefore, because the it is a exothermic process and it requires higher temperature and also the chemical reaction itself may be an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction, it may be temperature sensitive. And if one has to conduct such a reaction at the solid surface, the gas liquid fluid system at the solid surface, then the temperature at which the reaction actually is conducted must be in the same range where the adsorption of the species is likely to happen. Otherwise, what will happen is that the species is not readily adsorbed at that temperature and so conducting reaction at, at a temperature where the adsorption is not likely to happen will lead to low productivity because the species is not available at the surface for the products to be formed. So, a thumb rule is that the, the temperature at which reaction is conducted. must be in the range where adsorption is likely to happen. So, this process of chemical adsorption is also typically referred to as chemisorption. So, we will use this word quite option quite often Chemis chemical adsorption is also called as chemisorption. So, when the species actually binds to the active material what happens is that the species actually binds to what is called as the active sites which is present in the catalyst. So, let us define what is an active site.
So, active site is a point on the catalyst surface that can form strong chemical bond with an adsorbed atom or molecule. In fact, the active sites is actually quantified by what is called as a turnover frequency. or TOF in short. So, if I use the symbol F for turnover frequency, it is essentially defined as number of molecules reacting per active site per second. That is what is called as a, a turnover frequency and this is typically measured or calculated at a certain experimental condition. So, the active sites is essentially quantified by what is called as a turnover frequency which is essentially reflects what is the number of molecules that is actually reacting per active site per second at a certain experimental condition. Okay. So, since the reaction is happening at a certain temperature and the temperature also affects the adsorption process. One can actually classify catalyst based on the based on the temperature at which the reaction happens and the turnover frequency. So, there are several classes of catalysts. So, let us list down what these classes are. So, class of a reaction and the typical example of catalyst that is used for each of these classes. So, alkylation for example, alkylation and dealkylation reactions dealkylation reaction. Typical catalyst that is used is AlCl3, palladium and zeolites. And then isomerization reaction and typical catalyst that is used is AlCl3, platinum on alumina which is a a supported catalyst and zeolites and then you have hydrogenation and dehydrogenation reaction and the typical catalyst used are cobalt, platinum, Cr2O3, nickel, and then we have oxidation reaction which is very, very common. There are several oxidation reactions that is actually possible, copper, silver, nickel, vanadium pentoxide, platinum, so on and so forth. And then we have hydration and dehydration reactions the typical examples of catalyst that is used for this type of reaction are al2o3 and magnesium oxide and then we have halogenation and dehalogenation and the typical catalyst that is used are CuCl2, silver chloride 
and palladium. So these are the typical examples of catalyst actually that is used for different types of reactions. So we have classified these into six classes of reactions, alkylation and dealkylation which uses AlCl3 and palladium and zeolites as catalyst. We have isomerization which uses supported catalysts such as platinum alumina. We have hydrogenation and dehydrogenation which uses copal, platinum so on and so forth and then we have very, very well known oxidation reactions for which copper, silver and uh, nickel, vanadium oxide are used. And then hydra hydration and dehydration reaction for which alumina and MgO are used and then halogenation and dehalogenation for which copper chloride, silver chloride and palladium are actually used. So these are the typical catalysts that are actually used for different processes that are actually in place. So to summarize this uh, lecture, what we have learnt is that there are different properties of the catalyst, particularly the presence of the uh, pores which facilitates large, uh, uh, large area for the reaction, availability of large area for the reaction. And then we looked at supported and unsupported catalyst. We looked at the how the catalyst works. The catalyst typically uses this process of adsorption where the species comes and actually binds to the active sites. And this can be a, a chemical bond or a physical bond. The physical bond, a physical adsorption actually has a, a much lower heat of adsorption, whereas the chemical adsorption, which is also called as chemisorption, has a relatively higher heat of adsorption, which actually is comparable to that of the heat of reaction. And the key take home point is that if one needs to conduct a reaction at a certain temperature, then that temperature, particularly when chemisorption is involved, the, that temperature has to be in the same range at which the adsorption of the species can actually occur. Otherwise, the reaction will not happen due to lack of species that is actually adsorbed onto the surface. Let us look at a few examples of the actual catalyst. Here is the first example where you have 1 percent palladium which is actually coated or impregnated on the substrate alumina Al2O3. And you can see that the particles are actually spherical in nature, they are small balls here. They are about uh, 2 mm is the diameter of each of these. And if you look at another example where you have 1 percent palladium which is actually impregnated on activated carbon and you can see that the catalysts are actually the substrate is uh, cylindrical in nature and you will have lot of pores in which the 1 percent palladium is actually impregnated on this. And let us look at a third example where the catalyst is this tiny spherical particles which are actually powdery and it is actually 5 percent palladium which is actually coated on the substrate of alumina. So these are a few examples and of course there are catalysts which actually come in many, many different shapes and these are just a few examples of these. Thank you.